show on the road. Um, so want to um, uh, start uh, just by asking a quick question. How is the audio, how is my voice coming through? Um, somebody told me that it was a little quiet. Um, so I wanted to just quick ask you guys. So if you could type in the uh, the text chat or Discord, let me know how the audio is coming through. Um, that would be great. So anybody, anybody at all. Coming through good? Okay, it's not too soft. Okay. All right, just checking. Um, all right, so let's um, let's remind ourselves uh, what we did last time, uh, which was we looked at uh, a variation of the differential equation we had considered before, uh, where we tacked on uh, we tacked on this term here. And uh, what that basically did was gave us uh, sort of exponential growth up to a point, and then it started to kind of slow down. Um, and so this was perhaps a more reasonable model of population growth um, because uh, it can't be infinite, you know. So if you imagine you have a Petri dish or something um, full of bacteria, well, eventually the bacteria are going to run out of food, and so the, um, or there's not going to be enough food to, you know, sustain infant, or not infinite, but exponential growth forever. Eventually you hit some sort of limit. Um, this actually, uh, bacterial growth is probably not the, um, the best example of this, but, but um, say something more like human growth. Um, if you have, say, um, just imagine like um, uh, an island or something, then there's some number of people that the island's natural resources and um, agriculture would be able to support, and but there's some limit to that. And um, the um, you can increase the limit by you know discovering new agricultural techniques or uh, something like that, um, but but ultimately there's still some limit, and so uh, things will sort of level off to that to that limit. Um, okay, so what I wanted to do today, um, well, first off was to correct uh, an error from um, from uh, uh, Friday, which was so first off the differential equation in question. Um, so let's just remind ourselves, oops, let me do this in black, was y prime was k times y times l minus y. And um, we solved this um, for um, We solved this numerically um, using Euler's method, uh, and that worked great uh, to get sort of a, an approximate solution to something. Um, but the exact solution is what I, I kind of flubbed last time, so I wanted to um, kind of correct that issue. So I'm going to go to um, Mathematica and. Um, in Mathematica, let me blow up the font so you guys can read this nice and easy. Um, in Mathematica, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a function called dsolve. And so this Mathematica has pretty sophisticated differential equation solvers built into it. Um, and both numeric and exact uh, techniques. Uh, and so if in this particular case, uh, the exact solution is is well known. Uh, it's not too hard to derive with uh, a few techniques from Calc 2. Um, but the solution to it, uh, we can get by saying this. So our differential equation is y prime of t 
equals k times y of t times l minus y of t. The function that we're interested in is y of t, and the variable on which it depends is t. Um, now, I should re really add in here uh, one other thing, which is an initial condition that y of 0 is, let's call that y naught for just the initial, uh, the initial number. Um, oops, and I need a double equals there. Um, okay, why is that? Uh, well, here, let's just remove that. Okay, here we go. So the solution there that we get um, is this thing, okay? Um, and you see that it has this constant in there, C1. So that constant is going to be related to our value uh, of... Um, Um, oops, our value uh, at y equals 0. So if I define that thing as a function and I plug 0 into it, then I get this quantity. Okay, and so if I want to solve, um, basically, if I know that solution of 0 is supposed to be a specific number, let's say it's supposed to be 5, then I would set this equation equal to 5 and solve it for C1 in terms of the other things. Um, right, so the, the basic form of the solution is uh, that. Um, this can be rewritten in a couple of ways. Um, but, uh, but yeah. Um, now, we did this numerically last time, so... Uh, we got something that, that curve-wise approximated this, but here I just wanted to make sure that we were clear on the exact solution. And just for reference sake, uh, let's look at the, um, the documentation for dsolve, and I'll blow this one up too. Okay. Um, so we would be doing basically this first example, solving a differential equation with an independent variable. And so then they give you kind of an example here um, of a um, um, you know, couple of examples for how to um, how to get um, uh, or how to use it, right? So you put in the differential equation that you're interested in, what the function depends on uh, that you're interested in, and then the variable on which it depends. Um, and then uh, you can have constants in there. So like we had the constant, uh, the K and the L for K was sort of your growth rate, L was your, your limit, um, and so on. Okay. Um, now, while we're on the subject of this, um, we can actually also do, um, Mathematica can also do, uh, solve these things numerically um, and uh, using a function called ndsolve. So let's go back to the documentation and look at that. Okay, so ndsolve solves a differential equation, but it does it numerically, okay? Um, and so, for example, here, if I wanted to solve this differential equation with some starting value over a, for a given function over a range of values, then I would use this, and then I could plot it uh, using this command here. Um, now, the... Um, ndsolve basically does, um, uh, uses a numerical technique uh, to solve the differential equation. It's probably, well, so Mathematica has a library of very sophisticated techniques for doing this. Um, the Euler method is probably 
the least sophisticated technique for solving differential equations, but it's the easiest one to explain. Um, there are lots of other more sophisticated, more accurate ones, but they take a lot more computational power. Um, okay, so we'll, um, but we'll, we'll use this, um, this in a moment to, um, um, this ND solve function in a moment in order to um, uh, plot some solutions to uh, actually a system of differential equations. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna go back to the iPad for just a minute and um, I need to look up my equations real quick just to make sure that I get them right. Okay, so now what we're going to look at, so this is new. What about if we have, rather than a single differential equation, we have a pair or triple or some group of related differential equations. So um, one example are predator-prey models and I'm just going to copy these down from my reference and then I'll explain what each term, oops, what each term uh, is. So um, okay, so this is a system of two related differential equations um, and that uh, can be used to model a predator-prey system. So we'll sort of make the following assumptions. Um, that uh, let's say that you have a, a field and there are uh, pre there's a prey species like say rabbits or something and there's a predator species like say wolves or foxes or something and um, to simplify the the uh, discussion let's say that the rabbits are only they only ever are get eaten by foxes uh, they're the only uh, foxes are the only predator for these rabbits um, and that if there were no foxes, the rabbits, being rabbits, would uh, grow exponentially. Um, and then second, we'll also assume that the foxes, or the, the pre predator species, eats only the rabbits, and if there were no rabbits, they would basically starve to death. Okay, so um, the... The model here is if we look at the first term, so if beta is zero, then the first differential equation is dx dt equals alpha x. Well, that's exponential growth. And so what prevents the rabbits here from growing exponentially would be the second term um, that slows down the rate of growth, and that slowing down is going to depend both on how many rabbits there are and how many of the prey species, or excuse me, predator species there are. Okay, now on the flip side for the predator species, if delta is zero, then dy dt equals negative gamma of y, that's exponential decay. So that means that uh, everybody is going to uh, starve to death, and what prevents them from starving to death is by eating rabbits. Okay, so the two systems or the two equations sort of look um, almost like negatives of the other, and the only thing that prevents them from being identical to one another is the the constants out front are different for the two different equations. All right, so the first one is our prey. Um, uh, equation, and then the second one is our predator equation. 
Okay, so um, what I'm going to do uh, is we're going to actually solve this um, for an example um, an example set of values of alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Um, and um, I'm just going to pick these um, basically from an example in my reference. Um, and uh, so I'm going to choose here alpha is two-thirds, beta is four-thirds, gamma equals one, and delta equals one. So basically what these constants describe uh, is how fast the, um, the species would grow, um, assuming that they, they have unlimited growth potential, um, how fast they would die off um, if they were starving to death, and, and to some extent, like Delta, for example, would control um, basically how many new foxes do you get for each rabbit eaten, and Beta is going to control how many rabbits does each fox eat, um, and those values may depend on the species in question. So, you know, if you have a predator species like, say, uh, a fox, well, maybe for each, you know, one fox and one rabbit are roughly equivalent, um, but maybe another species like, say, a whale and um, uh, being the predator of, say, plankton, it's going to take gajillions of plankton for each uh, to, to basically feed a whale to grow a baby whale. Okay, so the values for the alpha and the beta um, are going to depend on on those things. Okay, so what I'm going to do, uh, we're going to do two things. I'm going to go back to Mathematica, is we're going to program in these differential equations and we're going to solve them in two different methods. Um, we're going to solve them using, um, so I'm going to get rid of that stuff, get it out of the way. Um, first, we're going to solve it using the ndsolve function. Okay, and um, so we'll solve it. Uh, first, I need to specify the two equations. So um, let me say prey of t, or prey prime of t, excuse me, uh, is a alpha, or I'll, I'll just use Roman letters, um, Uh, for for this for convenience okay so I'm just going to use prey and pred for uh, instead of X and Y um, mostly because Mathematica doesn't well it sometimes gets annoyed if you name a function X um, and uh, plus this will just be maybe a little bit more clear when you're looking back at it. All right, so that's our first equation. Our predators um, change at a rate of, what was it, delta times uh, pred of t times prey of t minus uh, gamma, or sorry, I'll just use g, minus g times pred of t. Okay, so there's that. We're going to need to sol uh, uh, set values um, for our constants. And I think we had already set, we had picked these as our example constants. Okay, so we need to specify what those are in advance. Okay, so let's um, let's look back at the uh, the ND solve documentation for a second. Um, so you guys can see exactly what its syntax is. Okay, so we're basically doing 
uh, this first one here, um, or something similar to the first one, we're solving a differential equation. We need to specify the initial number of predators and the initial number of prey, and we'll just make up some numbers there. What functions are we solving for? And then what range of t do we want to solve them over? Okay, so, um, all right, so let me uh, minimize that. Okay, so there's our set of equations. We also know that pred, how many predators are there at time zero? And how many prey is there at time zero? Well, let's just make something up. Let's say that there are 10 predators and 100 prey, and we'll just see what happens. Okay, now we're solving here for pred of t and prey of t. Uh, sorry, let me put those in the other, no, that's right, uh, the other order. Um, and we're solving on a range from t, let's just do 0 to 10 and see what happens. Okay. Um, all right, so what we got was, uh, sounds like a kind of an, oh, I think here you actually don't want the t's. Okay. Um, let me make sure that I haven't made any typos. Pred, prey. Ten, hundred. Actually, you know what? I think this should be. Okay. So what um, what it's telling us here is that um, uh, we might be getting kind of weird values. Okay. So. I'm going to call this object predprey, okay, and then I want to plot, um, let's see, I want to plot the predators of t, and then this um, little slash dot, and then t0 to 10 will um, okay, so we have some sort of exponential growth going on. Okay, that means that the constants are poorly chosen. Um, uh, okay, so that means, let me go back to these. Oh, okay, so this is totally screwed up. Um, why is this all screwed up? All right, well, so what's supposed to be happening here, and I'll have to see what I'm screwing up, is, um, well, let me just shrink this, and so maybe the numbers won't be so huge. Yeah, okay, so what we're getting is some sort of weird numerical uh, problem, uh, which probably means that I've screwed up my constants. Let me double check my reference real quick to make sure that I'm not... Um, not uh, being um, making a silly mistake. alpha x minus beta. Okay, so let's double check the differential equation. So pre prime, so this is the exponential growth part. That's the, uh, that. Then the predators is prey of t minus g 
pred of 0 equals 1, prey of 0 equals 1. Um, okay, I'm not sure what I'm messing up here, because um, this should work out much nicely. Um, I'll, I'll take a look at it after class and see, uh, see if I'm just being an idiot, which is entirely possible. Um, okay, so um, that was less than enlightening. Um, all right, so let me switch over to something I know is going to work, and we'll come back to this uh, later. Um, so, namely, so let me save this. Let me save this and um, go to something that I know is going to work, and sorry for the inception. Let me go to this document, uh, and I'll blow it up a little bit. And then I'm going to um, um, go back to the iPad for just a second. Um, and, okay, so the, the, really the system of differential equations I wanted to talk about are called... Um, uh, is called an SIR model. Um, okay, is it just me or is that really blurry? Looks kind of blurry on my preview. Does the, the iPad part look okay to you guys? Or does it look sort of blurry? Oh, okay. I think it was just me. Um, okay, so um, what I really wanted to talk about is what's called an SIR model. Okay, and you guys couldn't possibly imagine why um, we would be talking about this. So, um, so let's make a, a few assumptions. The population is T. So that's assumption number one. Um, and the second set of assumptions is basically this. The population is going to be divided into three categories. Susceptible, infected, and recovered. Okay, and so what's going to happen is you can move from the susceptible to the infected by coming in contact with somebody who's infected. You can move from the infected category to the recovered category by... Um, by recovering from the illness, and for the purposes of the model, uh, we'll assume that basically nobody dies of it, uh, but we could pretty easily add in a death category, or we could say something like, well, if 1% of the people die, then we'll just take whatever the recovered number is, take 1% of it, and say, okay, that part of the recovered category is the death part, and everybody else lived but recovered um, and to get sort of a rough estimate. Okay, so, so we have um, three uh, different population groups here, and the rate at which um, they're going to, uh, the, the populations will change from one category to the other uh, is the system that we want to look at, okay? So I'm going to use here S for susceptible, I for infected, and R for recovered, okay? And again, I've already used T for my population. So here's the system. S prime is negative beta times infected times susceptible. Um, divided by T, okay, um, and 
sorry, I just need to check the audio here. Um, okay, looks like we're good on audio. Um, okay, so that's the rate at which the susceptible become infected. Now, it's a negative uh, rate because uh, the susceptible population is continually being exposed to infected people and nobody becomes, if you become infected, you don't become susceptible again uh, with most diseases. Okay, then the infected uh, population is going to change at the opposite. Okay, so that part is um, people are moving from susceptible to infected. Okay, and so the first term there that I wrote, the beta I S over T, is uh, how fast people are becoming infected from being susceptible, and then people are going to recover, and they're going to recover at some rate. Oops, let me just say I there. They're going to recover at some rate that's perhaps proportional to the number of currently infected people. Um, and then the recovered population is going to change. Well, the I category was losing people to recovery at a rate of negative gamma I. So that means the recovered category is gaining them at that same rate. And then once you're recovered, that's it. You're recovered. Okay. So this is the basic SIR model for... Um, disease transmission. And the two constants here, um, the two constants there uh, basically describe um, how fast the d people move from um, disease to recovery, how fast uh, people get infected, um, and uh, those two constants basically, well, along with the initial number of infected people, will basically describe the, uh, the whole system. Um, okay, so um, first off, are there, any, uh, are there any questions about the differential equations themselves? Um, they're sort of deceptively simple in some sense, but... Uh, we'll also talk a minute about the what the constants mean. Um, so, um, let's see. It's um, one uh, one constant that's important uh, is. Um, let me make sure I've got this uh, correct. Um, so, you guys, how many of you guys have seen the movie um, Contagion? It came out in I think it was 2010, 2011, something like that. Um, uh, has anybody seen that, that movie? Bueller. No, nobody's seen that movie. Um, okay. Well, it's actually maybe worth watching. Um, so we'll talk about that later, but um, <clears throat> a lot of people are sort of looking at it as, you know, in 2010, 2011, it was just sort of a, a piece of science fiction, and then, um, well, it uh, there's a lot of similarity to the plot of the movie and the situation with COVID-19. Um, okay, anyway, so in that movie, and perhaps if you guys have been reading uh, anything about COVID-19, uh, a lot of people are talking about um, this number here called R0. So um, for some reason, uh, even American mathematicians adopt a, sort of the British um, pronunciation for a subscript of zero. We call it naught in a U G H T. So R0 um, is essentially a measure of how virulent or how um, quickly a disease spreads 
by sort of thinking about, okay, if you have a person, how many people on average is one infected person likely to also infect? And the higher that number is, the more quickly and more rampantly your disease spreads. So for example, um, for something like the flu, um, the flu has an R naught of like 1.1 ish. Um, some other diseases, so like for example typhoid, uh, has a R naught of some ridiculous number like 10. Um, and then the question with COVID-19 is, well, what is its R naught? And based on sort of rough estimations, uh, looking at data, uh, it's sort of speculated that it's in the two to two and a half range, uh, which means that on average, each infected person is gonna go on to infect uh, two other people who then go on to infect four other people who then go on to infect uh, eight other people, 16, 32, and, and then it, it, you know, it grows exponentially from there. Um, okay, so um, the uh, R-naught is defined as these two numbers, and then um, the what the, the beta and gamma themselves are is, um, so gamma is um, basically the, um, uh, one over the recovery time. Okay, uh, so for example, if it takes you two days to recover from an illness, uh, or sorry, two days during which you're infectious, then um, the the gamma would be uh, one half, or uh, well, one half if your time unit is in days, and it'd be one fourteenth if your time unit is in weeks. Um, the the particular example we're going to look at here with some flu data uh, is um, um, uh, we'll we'll look at this uh, with um, uh, in weeks instead of in days, but we could always tweak tweak things appropriately to get it in days. Um, so, and then uh, beta uh, is uh, actually the way I've defined it in the Mathematica notebook, we'll see it in a second, is beta is just gamma times R naught, and then R naught is what I'll specify. Um, and that will give me my two constants. Okay, so let me flop over to Mathematica here. And let's look at um, my set of assumptions. Okay, so let me get rid of this. All right, so here's my set of assumptions. Um, I was working off of a reference, and so I wanted to make sure that my I got everything pretty close to the reference. So I'm going to model here uh, T equals 150,000. So that's uh, 150,000 people, just say. Um, the initial number of infected I've chosen to be one person, uh, and then I want to show you guys something interesting that happens based on that. Um, I've defined the number of weeks that you're infectious to be, for the flu, it's a, uh, the reference I was looking at had it to be about this value. It would be basically two uh, divided by seven because uh, uh, it's basically two days, but the model is going to work in weeks, so I just had to convert that. Um, gamma is its reciprocal. For the flu, R0 is about this value. Beta is that thing times gamma, and then I'm going to model this up through 52 weeks, so a full year. All right, now, here, highlighted, is all of the differential equations that we wrote by hand. And... Uh, because, well, for a few reasons, so Mathematica um, has a lot of uh, letters as protected things, so you cannot name a function, for example, capital I, uh, because capital I stands for the square root of negative one in Mathematica, and um, uh, so to make this a little bit more clear, I just literally typed out susceptible 
uh, infected and recovered as the name of my functions. And then I went ahead and just typed out the constants uh, in, you know, transliterated Greek um, there. Okay, so I run this model, and what that is doing is basically like Euler's method uh, or, or some other numerical technique, but it's going to do it, and I don't have to program everything. Now, later I'll show you how we could actually manually program everything uh, with Euler's method, but we, we'll, we'll talk about that um, another time. Uh, for now, I just kind of want to talk about the, the solution and, and sort of how things turn out. Um, okay, then I'm going to plot the three functions, the susceptible, the infected, and the recovered, and um, uh, in blue, red, and a sort of dark green, respectively, and then put them all together on the same plot. Now, I left off a semicolon on this line here, which means that Mathematica will not suppress the output, so it will output things. Um, because I wanted to plot just the infection curve uh, by itself. But let's look at sort of the the money, uh, or yeah, the, the uh, all three graphs put together. Uh, so this probably looks somewhat familiar looking at three graphs like this. If you guys have been reading the news on um, the... Um, uh, the COVID-19 stuff. All right, so let's remind ourselves that the blue graph, the one here at the top, is the number of susceptible individuals, and it starts basically as all but the initial sick person. Uh, the green graph is the number of people that have recovered, and the red graph is the infection curve. So which on when I plot all three together with a population of 150,000, looks just kind of like a blip. This is why I plotted it separately up here, so that we could get an, a sense for what was the maximum number of infected people at any given time. It starts off down here at the lower left with one infected person, and then it spikes, okay, up to uh, maybe, you know, 1,100, 1,200, something like that, uh, and then it, of course, dies back off. Um, Okay, so the reason it dies back off is because now there's fewer uh, susceptible people for the virus to go around with, and uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, one of the things I'm going to do here um, to illustrate kind of an interesting point is let me suppose exact same model that there are, oh, sorry, before I do that. Um, also, let's look at what's the total number of people that get the infection? Well, where, what does the green curve appear to be leveling off at? It's maybe 30-something oh, thousand, um, so between 30, 40,000, somewhere in there. So out of 150,000, maybe roughly 20% get the flu out of, um, out of this, uh, or with this model anyway. I should say um, one other thing too, which is this is assuming that there is no vaccination uh, whatsoever, um, which for the case of COVID-19 is re realistic because we don't know of a vaccine yet. Uh, okay, so what I wanted to illustrate first off was what happens if we increase the number of initial infected people. So let me say that instead of one initially infected person, there's 10 initially infected people. So let's rerun the model. So one thing I want you to notice is that the peak of the infections actually is about the same as it was before, okay, in terms of the number of simultaneous infections. But what happened all that happened is basically it shifted everything time-wise uh, earlier, okay? And actually, um, I, my webcam is, is reversing things, so I need to reverse this. So it took basically the same graphs that we had before and essentially shifted them just to the left, meaning that the peak uh, of the infections 
here is happening at looks like maybe uh, 12 weeks or so roughly uh, whereas with one infectious person it was happening at like oh, 16 18 weeks okay but the the peak the height of that peak is roughly the same in either situation it's just a matter of when it happens Okay, and if I crank this up to 100 initially infected people, the similar sort of thing occurs. Now our peak is going to occur like at nine weeks, and uh, we are seeing a, a slight increase in the maximum number of simultaneous cases up to roughly 1,200, but it doesn't spike as high as perhaps you might have thought uh, for that initial population. Uh, it just sort of changes the, um, you know, how early the disease curve comes. And so if we keep cranking this up, similar thing here, the bubble occurs very early and then it dies off and we're starting to get to the point where um, Mathematica is getting kind of uh, unhappy with us. Um, yeah, okay, so let's go back to the case of just one infected individual. Um, okay, now I said this was for the flu, okay, and, uh, but what about, say, COVID-19? So I'm going to change the constants here, and let's say with COVID-19, we think that you're infectious for a period of like two weeks rather than two days. So let's pretend that we're still talking about the flu, but instead of two days, you're infectious for two weeks. Okay, then our disease curve is going to look exponential um, for over uh, a year. Um, okay, so the other thing, the other change I'm going to make is that I'm going to make the R naught something that's closer to what is estimated for COVID-19. Okay, and so we get this, which this curve, this set of curves probably looks really familiar uh, if you've been reading anything. Okay, so the, um, the now let's remember the initial population is 150,000. The initial infected is one person. The peak number of infections occurs at, uh, in this model, it'd be what, maybe 16 weeks or so, 16, 17 weeks, with a total of, um, the peak is the, the number of simultaneously infected people at 35,000, okay, which is over 20% of the population would have the disease at the same time. If we look at the recovered rate here, the recovery rate is leveling off to like 130,000. So what this means is almost everybody gets this disease. Okay, and uh, this curve or these curves look a lot like what you're seeing in the reporting and the modeling over uh, COVID-19. And sort of the issue is if this red curve, uh, if the height of it is ever above the, say, number of hospital beds that you have, uh, then you have a problem because it means that your death rates are going to go way up uh, because people won't have ventilators and, and things of that sort. Okay, so uh, again, um, the you know, the R naught value is really quite important. And so like if we play with it and let's say it was just two, then the peak occurs, you know, 20 something weeks later, but now not as many people are gonna get it, but it's still almost the whole population. And if we, you know, back this off to say 1.5, then we would have to run the model basically out further than a year. So let me run it out for, say, two years worth of time. Then we would see something like that, okay? So uh, let me put the values back. Um, that's the flu's value of R naught. 
okay? And if we run the flu model, we'll still see our peak at, uh, you know, a little over 1,100 cases. Uh, it just is kind of slow, okay? So this is, this is assuming that you stay infectious for two weeks, um, but that we have the R naught of the flu, and um, uh, which is kind of interesting and actually um, you know what I think I had something backwards earlier because when I had this as two sevenths um, sorry I think I want this as 14 not 2 um, Yeah, okay, I think I've got, I think I may have one of these fractions upside down. Um, so let's just, let's just go with two, the, um, the, or no, what was it, two, two sevenths. This was the flu number that we were working with. Um, okay, so we see our peak infections there. Uh, I'll, I'll look back and make sure that I'm not getting um, one of these two fractions upside down. Um, okay, so... Um, yeah, so there we get our, our peaks. Uh, so that was back to the flu model. But if we imagine, let's just say doubling the R0 value to 2, then we get the peak happening much earlier. And also the peak uh, skyrockets from just over 1,100 infected people to well over 20,000 infected people. So this R0 value is really, really important. Um, in terms of the disease progression. Um, and, um, yeah, so it, for example, in this particular model, assuming R0 of 2 and uh, flu-like infectiousness, then 120,000 pe people would get the disease, and the peak in number of infections would be here. Um, I'll, I'll double check this business on the constants to make sure I'm not messing things up, but okay. Um, all right, so that uh, that's maybe good enough for today, uh, just to give you a sense for um, the, the model that we're going to use. And then um, while it's the case that this particular command, um, from perhaps your perspective is just sort of magic and telling Mathematica to just do your work for you. Um, all of that work to solve that differential equation or that uh, set of differential equations, we can actually do Euler's method to do it, uh, kind of like we did uh, last week. It'll be a little bit messy, um, but, uh, but it's totally doable. So we'll look at that, getting into a little bit more of the weeds uh, next time, and then hopefully I'll have cleared up what the uh, the issue here was with my fractions being upside down, possibly, and also what on earth was going wrong in my predator prey example because that should have worked out sort of just fine. Um, okay, well, so we'll quit here, um, and I will see you guys on uh, Friday, if not sooner, on uh, Discord. Have a good rest of your Wednesday.